for joining us uh, this week for our uh, bi-weekly seminar. Um, so Bernard Haskovic will be presenting hedging risk factors. Um, we will welcome clarification questions during the, um, the presentation, um, but we expect longer questions to be asked uh, during the Q&A session. So the presentation will be for 15 minutes or as long as uh, the presenter wishes to present the paper, his paper, or not too long. Um, but uh, then uh, we'll have a 10 minute uh, Q&A session if there are any remaining questions. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really uh, appreciate, um, well, coming virtually here to, to present this paper. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Alan Moreira from Dorchester and my colleague from UCLA, Tyler Muir. So in this paper, we studied hedging uh, risk factors. And I'm gonna start with a motivating picture that you're probably well aware of it, but in the uh, first quarter, of uh, this year, 2020, we know that the uh, stock, the American uh, stock market, uh, experienced um, a drop of about a little bit over 30% uh, between uh, February and late March. And at the same time, there was like a significant, like a steep increase uh, in volatility. So this is a plot, just plotting uh, a one dollar investment in the beginning of January 2020, all the way to the end of the first quarter. Uh, of 2020 and the orange, uh, actually this color is called deep carrot color. Uh, it actually shows the VIX spiking to slightly above 80, which is uh, an extremely high value consider, considering it's like historical uh, average. This is not actually something very specific to this recession. This um, strong pattern is present in, in many other recessions. So for example, if we go back uh, another decade, for the recession of, um, of 2008 and 2009, what we see is exactly the same thing, which is that you have a significant stock market crash associated with, the, uh, with, with an economic recession. Uh, in this case, it was like closely related to the financial sector and also coinciding with this uh, spike, steep increase uh, in volatility. So these two recessions, I think they highlight a pattern, which is that you have the COVID-19 recession, you have steep uh, market crashes. You have volatility uh, spiking in both cases, slightly above uh, 80%. If we look at the data in a more, um, looking at the entire time series and looking at how a uh, stock market usually reacts to economic recessions, what we find is that on average, um, NBR recessions, which are like uh, um, economic recessions, they're associated with market drops of 20% uh, on average. So this is a relatively uh, significant uh, number considering that, for example, the equity premium in a year is about on average, it's like six, seven uh, percent. Mm -hmm. And recessions here, they range between uh, five months, maybe to something a little bit above uh, greater than a year. So this is like a deep, um, uh, strong um, uh, stock market crashes that, uh, that actually happen. So there is a strong relation between market crashes in the real economy and actual recessions that um, um, households and investors, everyone is actually uh, facing, just like the one we're, uh, we're seeing now. Recessions are risky not only because you have these uh, stock market crashes, but also because you have many other sources uh, of risks associated with recessions. For example, if you're a business owner, uh, you're not sure if you can rely on your suppliers because they may uh, have gone buying bankrupt you don't know if you're going to rely on the future demand for your product, for example, because you don't know if your customers are going to have money. You don't know if your credit lines are still guaranteed because credit rules may change. Uh, you don't know if your uh, uh, satisfies any like regulation boundary in terms of leverage. So a lot of things change uh, in those periods and they are inherently risky uh, for that reason. So uh, the main question we study in this paper is whether we can hedge recession risk. So can we red hedge recession risk? And if we can, if we're able to construct these hedge portfolios, which I'll show you that it's, uh, we're able to do that. The key question then is uh, at what reduction in expected returns? In terms of the premium associated with these hedge portfolios, what is the magnitude of that? 
So these are going to be the two key uh, underlining questions that we're going to be addressing along uh, along today's talk. Um, and how are we going to do this? Well, first, uh, in terms of macroeconomic factors, there is several uh, indicators of the, the real economy, the activity of the real economy. You could look at consumption, GDP. Some of these data, they are uh, at a quarterly frequency. Others are a little bit higher frequency. For example, industrial production, uh, an initial claims, they're even available at a weekly frequency and so on. In the macro finance literature, you have different macro-based asset pricing factors like the parker Juliard uh, consumption factor, uh, Q4 to Q4 consumption growth and future consumption growth and, and so on. The idea is to construct portfolios that are going to be sensitive to those indicators. Our portfolios that are going to perform well when these indicators are, let's say, doing well, when consumption is high, for example, and they're doing poorly when the economy is doing poorly, when consumption is low, maybe unemployment uh, is high. I don't think I'll have time to go over in the talk about these reduced form asset pricing factors, but we do the same analysis for these reduced form uh, asset pricing factors. I want to quickly go over the, uh, the approach before getting to the details and give a highlight of the main results. In terms of the approach, what we do is something that I think it's fairly straightforward, which is to construct portfolios based on exposures. We're going to compute for each um, security a beta relative to macro indicators. So imagine that these are going to be per portfolios uh, based on, for example, uh, industrial production beta or initial claims beta or consumption beta and so on. So these are going to be portfolio sensitive to macroeconomic conditions. So these, we're going to then construct these uh, beta sorted portfolios. And we think this is a good and natural methodology to build uh, macro, macro sensitive portfolios in the sense that the high beta portfolios are going to be more sensitive to the economic activity. That means that they perform well when these indicators are performing well, when consumption is high, GDP is high, when unemployment is low, and so on. And the low beta on these on the other uh, part of the spectrum, these on these macro sensitive portfolios, these are portfolios that actually perform well in bad times. These are like a hedge in that sense. And the hedge portfolios we're going to construct are basically long short portfolios that we're going to long portfolios that perform well in bad times and we're going to short portfolios that perform poorly uh, in bad times. Um, so for this to be successful we need to have enough uh, persistence in the uh, exposure of the assets to these macroeconomic conditions and in addition to that uh, you need to, uh, to be able to have enough dispersion. They have to be persistent enough. You need to have enough dispersion to have any uh, significant, both in the statistical terms and economic terms, uh, in terms of the uh, post-formation uh, betas of these portfolios. So our key finding is that we find good hedge portfolios against risk factors in the sense that they do have these uh, post-formation betas that are significant and both statistically and economically, and I'll be very clear about that. But the key result is that they perform well in bad times. So this, uh, the hedge in that sense, it uh, works. One interesting uh, comment here, which is that if you look at the paper that is available online, our sample ended in 2017 or 2018, and we haven't like included the pandemic, but now we updated the paper. So the results that I'm gonna show here, they're gonna be a little bit different from the actual paper because we extended that to include the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, stock returns data. And this is a genuine out of sample result because we haven't changed anything in the methodology uh, of what we actually implement. The only thing we did was to update the sample and just run the same uh, set of results using the longer sample. The surprising result, however, is that these hedge portfolios, they are cheap. Cheap in the sense that these macro sensitive portfolios have similar average returns regardless if they are more sensitive or less sensitive uh, to broad uh, macroeconomic conditions. So one important question that I really want to clarify here is why are these findings surprising? For some of you, you may think that it's actually very surprising because we're able to hedge um, economic risk, essentially macro risk uh, at a relatively low cost in terms of reducing uh, average expected returns. But there is a well-known phenomenon in the literature, which is a weak relation between macro economy in returns. These two things are not always like a one-to-one, -one, but one salient uh, pattern that we have in the data is that 
market crashes on the eve of recessions. So usually um, crashes anticipate future economic conditions. And this is exactly um, the, the type of uh, risk that we're gonna be able to hedge. And I'll, be, and I'll show you how the portfolio performed in every single crash uh, since, since uh, the 80s. The usual argument for these results to be surprising is that there should be no free lunch in the sense that assets that pay well in bad states of the world, they have to have a negative uh, risk premium. Now, we know that at the same time, because of this weak relation from the first bullet point between macroeconomy and returns, the standard um, uh, consumption-based models have been widely rejected in the data. But we know also know that more recent views and new uh, frameworks, they provide a much more, let's say, hopeful view uh, of all these like a macro uh, consumption-based asset pricing uh, factors. There are like two broad categories that I think our results uh, speak to, which are these uh, scale consumption models and these long run uh, risk models. For these scale consumption models, I think our model, our results speak to uh, more directly because in these models, this is a quote from uh, Sidney uh, Ludwigson, the key channel through which uh, you can make um, consumption to matter for asset prices is to somehow make in the bad states of the world, the assets are become more correlated uh, with consumption. And that's exactly when the premium are high. So this is like a, a unique combination that several of these models have. These are like models that have conditional and time varying uh, uh, prices of risk for, uh, for consumption. What do we do in terms of relating to this, uh, this set of results and, um, and why our findings is surprising is exactly our focus on, uh, on recessions. We're using different from a lot of the previous work, work in this uh, literature, we use the cross-section of assets to hedge macro risk. And we find that market crashes associated with uh, macro risks, they're actually hedgeable uh, in the sense that these long short portfolios, they're an effective tool to reduce the exposure to, uh, uh, to macroeconomic recession, especially uh, in bad times. In bad times, I mean here, uh, NBR, uh, NBR recessions. If these are gonna be tradable in well diversified portfolio, there's the, there is a direct application um, uh, for asset management uh, if you want. So the way we view our set of results is uh, or maybe at least the way I view it is that uh, these hedge portfolios, you can interpret them as a tool uh, kind of to move forward in terms of uh, for the future uh, consumption based uh, based model. We're documenting a pattern in the data that I think uh, will probably make us uh, um, revisit uh, a lot of the consumption based models and, and discipline a little bit on how to uh, how to move forward. Okay, so let me be more specific about what we do, because I think I'm maybe promising a lot, and if I don't deliver, uh, some of you might be mad. So uh, we're going to build these hedge portfolios. In terms of the data, we're only using very standard uh, data sets. On the macro side, and that's like where I will focus most of the attention today, I have the asset pricing results in the paper in these slides as well, but I don't think I'll have time to go uh, over them. For the macro side, we use industrial production, monthly frequency, we have initial claim, which is a, a um, um, indication of uh, unemployment. We flip the sign of initial claim growth. These are all growth uh, levels so that it goes up in good times and low uh, in bad times. We also have credit spreads. Credit spreads tend to widen in bad times. So again, we flip the sign uh, for that. Uh, it's slope of the term structure. And we're gonna also create a combined version of the series, which is simply an equally weighted average of these uh, four series above. And we're gonna consider different uh, ranges as well. So industrial production growth over one month, three months, six months, and so on. And also have NBR recessions, uh, GDP and, uh, and consumption growth. For the asset pricing, we have very standard uh, from a French factors, momentum, uh, betting against beta. We also have the uh, uh, Daniel uh, and the DMRS uh, hedged uh, uh, portfolios as well. But I don't think I'll be able to uh, go over that uh, today. To build the hedge portfolios, we're gonna construct the beta as of each security in a very similar fashion to, um, uh, to the framework in the betting against beta because we wanna decompose a little bit the correlation from the variance ratio. Our results are robust to changing this to have just like a simple rolling window. Um, so what we have here is that we are going to compute these betas if we have daily returns. 
uh, we're going to use a 24 month window. If we have monthly, we basically take like 10 years uh, of data. So we have enough observations to construct that. Then we're going to sort portfolios based on these betas. So this is, imagine that we're computing a beta relative to each one of those factors. And then we're sorting them from low beta to high beta. And then we're going to define the breakpoints based on the New York Stock Exchange uh, stocks. So that we guarantee that there's no bin that is too uh, small in terms of market cap. And we're going to construct value-weighted uh, portfolios within each quintile. So we think that this methodology, the fact that we use New York Stock Exchange quintiles and value-weighted portfolios makes this a tradable, uh, a tradable st strategy in every single quintile. Then we're going to long the low beta quintile and short uh, the high beta quintile. In terms of what to expect from, let's say, uh, finance uh, 101 is that if this hedge works, we should expect a negative premium in the sense that these are portfolios that perform well in bad times. So they are hedges and then they should carry uh, a negative uh, expected return. What we find from the data is that that's not actually true. And this is not true, not for like one specific time series, but pretty much to every single one uh, we look at for industrial production, one, three, uh, one, three, six months ahead, or initial claims or um, uh, credit spreads. We have this is a strong pattern that we have uh, we have in the data, despite they having large negative uh, post formation betas. The large negative post formation beta is important because that's what defines them as effective hedges. Otherwise, if they don't have post formation betas and they have a premium of zero, then it's just they they don't really do anything. Uh, um, in a tradable uh, in a tradable way, and then they're not actually effective hedges. So that's not what we have. We have hedges that actually work with significant post formation exposures, and even though they have a, a premium of uh, close to uh, close to zero. Um, okay. So for the results, I want to start off showing a lot of the results for the individual factors. Um, some people are not very familiar on in terms of how the market portfolio relates to these uh, macroeconomic indicators in, in a general sense. And what I want to do first is start with the market portfolio. And I want to show you exposure to industrial production and employment, credit spreads, and term premium. And then I'm going to show you the exposure of the, of the hedge portfolio. And then ultimately, the, the goal here is to have a market hedged uh, portfolio. Starting with the market exposure. So I hope everyone is uh, being able to see this picture. Uh, what we have here is we're regressing um, the market portfolio on a constant and the one month change in industrial production. So this is actually uh, one month ahead change in industrial production regressed on uh, stock market returns. So stock market returns usually anticipate uh, changes in industrial production. And what we I'm plotting here is just like the beta coefficient from that regression and the 95% confidence interval. So this is showing that industrial production and, and stock market returns are correlated. That's pretty much what it does. Enough covariance that leads to a significant uh, change uh, uh, in market portfolios. And the number, the way to interpret here is we're standardizing industrial production, everything on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, these are annualized values. So basically one uh, standard deviation increase in industrial production is associated with a, an increase of uh, about, I think, eight. Uh, percent per year uh, in, in, in stock market returns. If we look three month change in industrial production, it becomes a little bit stronger, but the point here is that it's positive and significant. If we look six months ahead in industrial production, again, we find exactly the same pattern. Now, if we look at, for example, initial claims, uh, flipping the sign again so that it goes uh, up uh, in good times and down in bad times, what we have is that there is the same uh, pattern uh, that we see, even if we look at one month ahead, three, six uh, months changes uh, in initial claims, we have exactly the same pattern. If we look at credit spreads, so credit spreads, they tend to widen uh, in bad economic uh, conditions, in bad times, and we have the same pattern again that uh, they're correlated with the, market, uh, with the market performance. For the slope of the yield curve, we don't find a significant one. We kept it here. It's an indicator that a lot of people like to think as a, as a are very related to broad macroeconomic conditions. So we're, uh, we decided to keep it here as well. Now, this is essentially showing that the market, the, the market returns, realized returns, co-vary with changes in macroeconomic condition. 
And it kind of doesn't matter on how you actually measure uh, those changes in, in, in market economic conditions. Now, once we, the next set of uh, bars that I'm going to show is actually look at the hedge portfolio. The hedge portfolio is that long short portfolio that we long um, uh, these low beta assets and short the high beta, uh, the high beta assets. So that what we have is a portfolio that if the post formation betas are significant and they are, they perform well uh, in bad times. And what we have here is that this is the actual um, uh, post formation betas of these, uh, of these hedge portfolios. And this is essentially showing that the hedge portfolio performs poorly when these indicators are high. So it has exactly the same pattern, uh, opposite pattern of the market portfolio. So this is in the sense that these hedge portfolios, they seem to be like an effective hedge against, uh, against the market exposure to these broad uh, macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic indicators. So you see that all the, uh, the bars on the right part of the graph are negative and on the left are positive. The left is the market, the right is the hedge portfolio. Okay, so one issue with this, the way we've been moving is that there's a lot of data there. We have basically like many different versions of industrial productions, different versions of uh, initial of, uh, unemployment indicators. We have credit spreads. There's a lot of like moving parts to some extent. So what we do is a very naive way to combine these macro uh, indicators. And we simply take an equally weighted average of these four broad indicators. The one month industrial production, one month unemployment, credit spreads and term premium. And we're going to conduct exactly the same analysis. So now once we have these um, combined macro factors, we're gonna hedge against these combined macro factors. The benefit of that is that now we have one single macro hedge portfolio. And this macro hedge portfolio is going to be related. Uh, we, well, we're going to check if it's related to other uh, macroeconomic indicators. Uh, so, for example, if we um, look again at the market exposure now to other macroeconomic uh, indicators. So, for example, the NBR recessions. So, usually this is an annualized value. So, usually at annualized value, NBR recessions, uh, because we flip the sign, they perform 30 percent, 30 percentage points lower than non-NBR recession dates. Um, uh, on non-NBR recession dates, that's roughly about 10%. So the difference is those 20% that I mentioned uh, in the first slide. So the market crashes uh, prior uh, to NBR recessions. The market also um, suffer a significant reduction in value prior to changes to drops in consumption, uh, GDP growth, dividends, profits, uh, and also the uh, Parker Jr. consumption uh, factor as well. So this is showing that the market is not only related to these uh, industrial production, unemployment, and things like that, but also to other indicators. And those, some of these are like at a higher, uh, sorry, at a lower frequency, like quarterly or annual data, which makes it very hard to construct these data sorted portfolios. What we do is take that combined macro factor, hedge against the combined macro factor, and then look at the hedge portfolio and see how, what is the uh, exposure to these indicators? How is that macro hedge portfolio is doing in terms of hedging against recession and hedging against uh, GDP growth or profits growth and so on? What we find is that it is actually an effective hedge against recessions. And this is a very important result, uh, result for our paper because it's saying that the average return of these like macro sensitive uh, uh, portfolio, this like hedge portfolio, is actually very large negative to the uh, uh, to NBR recessions in the sense that it's going to perform well in recessions as opposed to perform poorly uh, in recessions. This pattern is also uh, present when we look at the exposure to, for example, consumption growth or GDP growth, uh, dividends, uh, profits, and the Parker Juilliard. Uh, consumption factor as well. So what we have is that the hedge, this hedge portfolio, I know that this is like a hedge against this like broad, this combination of macro factors, but it hedges against not only against uh, industrial production and employment and these more narrowly defined macro indicators because of their uh, higher frequency, but also to these broad uh, macroeconomic indicators that um, well, everyone has in mind when you think about a recession, you think about NBR, a recession or you think about 
quarter GDP growth, not if the industrial production in that month was down or up, but really at this like broad uh, uh, crisis that happened in like a quarter or two quarters and so on. So what we have is that our hedge portfolio is an effective hedge against uh, macroeconomic conditions. In the paper, we have the same like exposures, but relative to the industrial production and employment and the results are, are, are pretty much like consistent in the sense that it's gonna have a negative exposure uh, to these uh, higher frequency macro indicators. What we need to understand next is that, okay, we can build a hedge portfolio that is going to perform well in bad times. That seems to be an attractive uh, uh, portfolio because of that feature. One important question though is, uh, well, what is the cost of doing that? Are we giving away premium uh, with respect to, to that? So if we look at the average return on the market, I know this is like a big uh, bar plot. It has the mar average market return. So this is the, from the Ken French uh, website. And this is the 95% uh, confidence interval. The average return on the hedge portfolio, and I'm gonna show the, the, the hedge portfolio using this combined macro factor, but the results are similar if we use this other uh, hedging against industrial production, hedging against initial claims and so on. What we find is that it's, uh, it's actually very close to zero and it's statistically uh, insignificant. I wanna highlight that it's statistically insignificant, not because it's noisy and it has like a large confidence interval, but actually because the confidence interval is pretty much the same like size as the market portfolio, but really because you have uh, the coefficient is close to zero. Now, if we, once we have this hedge portfolio, this is a, a long short portfolio. So in the sense uh, it's constructed in, in a similar way of, for example, the common French factors is like long short portfolios. So we're not taking into account, for example, transaction costs or uh, liquidity issues and so on. But the fact that we're using quantiles, I think it makes a huge difference uh, on that front. But what we can do is take this long short portfolio and add to the market portfolio. So this is going to be, imagine that we're constructing a portfolio with your $1, you buy the market portfolio with the $1, you long the long leg of the hedge portfolio, short the short leg of the hedge portfolio, and then I'm gonna look at the performance of that in excess uh, of the risk-free uh, rate of return. So essentially summing the blue, the first, um, um, the first bar with the second bar. Um, I was gonna say blue, but yeah, it's like the first bar and the second bar, the third bar is this like a market plus, uh, plus hedge portfolio. And you see that it's pretty much very similar to the market portfolio in terms of uh, average returns. It's not more noisy, like the, the length of the, uh, of the confidence interval is the same, which in other words says that the sharp ratio hasn't uh, decreased uh, when you add that hedge. Actually, it increases a little bit and uh, the tables in the paper show that. Um, but at the same time, it's not the same as the market portfolio because it's going to inherit some of these hedging properties uh, from the hedge portfolio. But, uh, just to clarify, yeah. so you're saying that the hedge portfolio has a negative cost in some sense because the, it's close to zero, but actually positive number. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, you could think as a negative, but it's slightly, yeah, it's slightly negative, but it's, it's like zero. We interpret it as a zero, but yeah. Like in some no. sense, we are kind of related, like you're saying that I was trying to relate this to a betting against beta kind of a story, uh, but on a macro risk angle. Yeah. Kind yeah, of the betting against beta is about uh, sorting portfolios based on market betas market beta, and yeah. then do the same like long short exercise. But they construct the long short in a very, let's say, particular way because they have these uh, rank weighted portfolios. Uh, it's, it's like very specific to that framework. We do something that I think it's a lot simpler because it's just sort on betas, put into quintile bins and then do, you know, uh, bottom minus top uh, quintile. But the other difference is that they are sorting on market betas. You are not sorting on market betas. You no, know. no, no. They're sorting, yeah. exactly. They're sorting on the CAPM betas. We're sorting on the betas to these like macro indicators. Yeah. yeah. In some sense, there's a flatness of that uh, relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The relation between expected returns and, uh, um, and these macro factors is, uh, is flat. 
what we have in the um, in the reduced form asset pricing results in the paper is kind of we look at the version sim the same like apply the same methodology to risk factors like if we apply to the market portfolio then we're pretty much doing something very similar to betting against beta it's just a slightly different methodology but we do the same thing for example to hedge against momentum or to hedge against the uh, uh, investment or profitability factors and we find the same flattening uh, flat relation between expected returns and uh, in exposure to, to risk factors. Um, okay. So I want to show the, um, as, uh, as an anecdotal from, from the other plots, we know that once we add these two portfolios, the same thing is going to happen to the exposure. So basically this macro hedge portfolio, this market plus hedge portfolio is not going to be exposed to these macroeconomic uh, uh, indicators to so this like recession risk. But at the same time, I think it's also nice to look at the performance uh, focusing on specific recessions, because I think they show uh, uh, it's a very nice way to uh, portray uh, a key finding of our paper. So here is the same plot I had in the beginning. I just removed the VIX because I don't want uh, to uh, have attention drawn to that. What we have is this $1 portfolio in this like three month window uh, in the first quarter of 2020. This is the market portfolio. And this is the market plus the hedge portfolio. So what we have is, it is an effective uh, hedge, even in the current recession, even in the in the last market crash that happened. And again, I want to emphasize that this is an out of sample, an out of sample result because we really haven't uh, changed the methodology in like any in any way at all. The only thing we did is to add more data points uh, in all the way to uh, Q1 2020. So we see that this is a hedge that actually uh, worked uh, even in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, market crash. If we go back another decade, and then now I'm gonna show you for several uh, recessions. There are not many, they're not very frequent. They're not as frequent as they used to be before the 80s. So we go back another 10 years and we see the 2008 uh, market crash. This is the well-known uh, drawdown of like over almost 60% in market, uh, um, in market value. And this is the performance of our market plus hedge portfolio. I want to emphasize that all the way to early 2009, our market plus hedge portfolio has lost maybe like 10% in terms of value. And then once the market rebounded, our market plus hedge portfolio crashed, crashed all the way to like 60%. And then the two starting to co move again. So this is a, a, a hedge that worked exactly as intended in the sense that when it was rebounding, it was performing uh, uh, poorly, but when the market was uh, tanking, our market plus hedge portfolio was holding uh, fairly well. Um, okay, so if we go back another like six year to the recession of 2001, this was like a very short uh, lived uh, dot com bubble uh, related recession. And what we have is we have a similar pattern in the sense that we have all these uh, market crashes uh, that our market plus hedge portfolio successfully avoided, except the first, the first like decline in the very left hand side of the of the picture uh, wasn't really avoided, but overall it was. Uh, this is the 1991 uh, recession was also a very uh, short lived recession. This one, our market hedge portfolio, it didn't really hedge that recession in the beginning, but the rebound was uh, was actually uh, stronger. And I'm promising I'm almost done going over the recessions. I could keep going back. The last one I'm gonna show is in the 80s because they're like two recessions very close to each other, almost back to back. And our hedge portfolio also successfully uh, a hedge, especially the 1982 uh, recession. Now, I know these are just a, a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence. One that I wanna emphasize in particular is what happened in 1987, which is the, uh, there's like a, a huge liquidity drop uh, in the market, there was like a large crash in October 1987, and this is one not related to microeconomic conditions, as far as I know. I don't remember, but uh, I read about it, and it was not related to macroeconomic conditions. And our ma uh, macro hedge portfolio is never intended to hedge against this type of event, and it didn't. It performed pretty much very similar to the market, you know, a little bit high, a little bit below, but overall uh, very similar uh, to the market uh, in this uh, in, in 1987 in the crash of 1987. 
Okay, so in the paper, I have a lot of uh, tables like showing exactly the sensitivity of the market and so on. Most of those sensitivities, once you add the market hedge, the hedge to the market portfolio, they're reduced by about like 60% uh, on average. The paper has all the numbers uh, to be very precise. What I want to emphasize as well is that the way we're doing this market hedge portfolio is a very naive way. We're not optimizing in, in any way possible. All we're doing is taking the market portfolio and adding the hedge. Now, if you add more of the hedge, you're going to reduce even more of the exposure. If you add a little bit less of that hedge, you're going to reduce less of the exposure. So I think one interesting comment to make here is that you could think about optimal ways to actually hedge uh, the market portfolio uh, uh, against macroeconomic conditions, or you could also impose uh, leverage ratios so that you know the extent to which you're able to hedge. And then you could think as a, like a decomposition on what is hedgeable and what is not hedgeable. A key result we have is that certainly a significant part of these recession related risks are hedgeable using the cross section uh, of equity returns. Now, the next thing I want to quickly um, mention, and just check my time. Okay, am I running out of time or no? Okay, so the macro hedge portfolios, they can also be these macro sensitive portfolios, they can be viewed as new test assets. And what do I mean by that? Is that you have this uh, literature documenting that consumption uh, is price is just depend exactly on, on how you construct and the framework you use and so on, which is related to that slide that I mentioned uh, earlier uh, in the talk, slide number seven. Uh, and three important um, factors in this literature is the Parker Julia consumption growth, uh, which is like a smooth uh, uh, consumption uh, over uh, a certain period of time. Q4 to Q4, so this is fourth quarter to fourth quarter consumption growth from uh, Yaganathan and Wong. And you have this unfiltered consumption growth, which is that a lot of like the NEPA data, you have like a filtering methods to smooth consumption. And then actually, if you removed all those filters, you actually have a more like raw measure of consumption growth that is a lot more volatile and more related to stock markets. And the typical results that follow this, uh, this uh, literature is that if you estimate uh, the factor slopes, so like, this is related to Hui's question that, oh, it means that the relation between betas and returns is too flat. So betas and returns being too flat is like lambda one is like low. And then you're gonna put a lot of work on lambda zero if you decide to include it in your, uh, in your regression. But the, the key uh, way forward in this literature has been to take this consumption-based models and let's try to explain uh, the FAMA and French uh, 25 portfolios that both sorted on size and book to market. And what we have is that the uh, Parker Juilliard, Q4 to Q4, and future consumption, they roughly worked. Uh, some here are not statistically significant, but uh, it's by a very small margin. And because I'm using a longer sample uh, than the original studies, but broadly they, they, hold, uh, they, they hold in terms of explaining uh, um, uh, the cross-section of returns in these two dimensions of book to market and, uh, and size. However, if we take the same uh, consumption-based factors and try to explain uh, these uh, 10 macro-sensitive portfolios, what we have is a, a point estimate that is uh, close to, to zero. So we do have this um, uh, point estimates that are significantly lower, which suggests that if you interpret this result literally, it means that these consumption-based uh, factors are not really priced in our 10 macro-based sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, sorted portfolios. However, they are priced in the uh, 25 from in French, uh, from in French portfolios. So they can explain the 25, but not necessarily the 10 micro sensitive portfolios. At the same time, you don't have a lot of difference in specter returns in this 10 asset portfolio. So there isn't much to be explained anyway. Yeah. But uh, I guess you kind of say that the explanation is actually going the other way as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's, uh, that's related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly go over um, this because I do want to mention the uh, stochastic discount factor bounds that we have uh, results on that. But to quickly uh, rethink this is we, you can use our results in part to revisit this idea of the prices of risk uh, of macro factors. The typical approach has been to use 25 uh, portfolios. 
Um, but on the other hand, if you're thinking uh, what would be the ideal set of assets that these assets should explain, perhaps should be exactly portfolios that are sensitive to, to microeconomic conditions. So in that sense, that's why we think it's a natural way, uh, a natural way to apply because they are, they have a lot of exposure. They have a sensitivity to these factors, but not necessarily, uh, uh, but you have an overall flat relation between these two. Um, and basically we can use these new test assets, these macro sensitive portfolios to evaluate models uh, directly. And we find very different estimates for the price of risk, uh, point estimates being always lower and, uh, and, and closer to, uh, to zero. Now quickly, in terms of the, our results of these being able to hedge macroeconomic recessions, it has an important implication for the volatility of the stochastic discount factor. And what do I mean by that is that uh, so far, there's like an inconsistency with existing factors as like a single factors or if you have more factors. It could be, for example, that our hedge portfolio is loading on some unobserved factor. So let's say that uh, there's some factor that we're not observing when you're sorting on these macroeconomic indicators. And essentially we are constructing long short portfolios that are based on this unobserved, uh, unobserved factor partially at least. A key question is, can we say anything about these omitted factors? And the contribution of the macro risk to the overall like sharp ratio of these portfolios, I think it's going to be able to tell us something about how much macro risk matters for the overall volatility of the stochastic discount factors. We're going to be able to give a bound on the volatility uh, of the SDF. Our approach is going to be the following. It's going to be specific to a model, but we're going to do for several different models. So imagine that you pick the FEMA model here. I mean an empirical uh, model like factor model. Imagine that you take the FEMA French three or five factor model. Then we can look at the sharp ratio bound implied by the reduced score model basically take the uh, mean variance efficient frontier unconditional uh, in the full sample. Then we're gonna take that mean variance efficient portfolio and we're gonna hedge against macroeconomic exposure. We're gonna add our macro hedge in a way that optimally eliminates total, uh, completely exposure to NBR recession. Non, th these portfolios are not gonna be tradable, but they still gonna give us, uh, teach us something about the bounds of the SDF. And intuitively, the, the mechanism that we're uh, using to uh, find this bound is that this mean variance efficient portfolio hedged against macroeconomic risk, hedged against recessions, is going to have a sharp ratio. And it may be like a little bit lower or not. We know that from the first bullet point, that's like the unconditional highest uh, sharp ratio that you have. And then how much you drop is going to be informative about the contribution of macro uh, risk to the SDF. Imagine that you don't really drop anything. So then essentially it doesn't really matter how much uh, uh, macro risk for the volatility of the SDF. Now, if it drops a lot, then you're actually taking on uh, a, lot of that, uh, a lot of that risk. Now, our approach is going to be very, um, very simple to do this calculation. It's going to follow very similar set of calculations as the, um, Hansen Yaganathan bound, for example. We start with like just a, a normalized uh, stochastic discount factor uh, to be average one. Uh, it's exposed negatively to uh, Z here. Z is the, uh, the macro indicator, if you want. And then you have this other factor F that is possibly also priced here actually with a positive price of risk. Now, the RZ is the hedge portfolio. It pays exactly minus Z plus some, some noise. And the mar market macro hedge portfolio, the one that fully hedges against that, it's essentially the market portfolio plus our hedge portfolio. But the plus is going to be multiplied by a constant such that it fully eliminates Z uh, to the, from the picture. And then what we have is that the market is going to have zero exposure uh, to uh, um, this is like a portfolio that has zero exposure to macro uh, economic risk. Then we can start off from the other equation uh, of this portfolio, assuming it's uh, the other equation hold, which is a very like general in assumption uh, that this um, macro hedged uh, portfolio is priced. 
And then we can compute a bound uh, on the sharp ratio. Uh, the sharp ratio is going to be bounded by uh, this volatility of this uh, unobserved uh, factor. And then once we have that, we're able to compute uh, the, the uh, decompose the volatility of the stochastic discount factor. Remember from the first slide, I'm going to go back very quickly. Uh, you can imagine that this is the stochastic discount factor. And then you have a volatility coming from Z and you have volatility coming from F. I basically want to know, well, what is the magnitude of this volatility? Ultimately, I want to know how big B is. That's the, the goal. Uh, then what we have is that we can write the stochastic, uh, the volatility share of the stochastic discount factor due to, uh, to that macro component in, in closed form as the one minus the ratio of these two sharp ratios, the sharp ratio of the mean variance efficient uh, macro hash portfolio and the sharp ratio of the mean variance efficient portfolio unconditionally. The details are in the paper of this, uh, of this calculation. But the results are very interesting, I think, which is that um, in, in, in this table, what we have is we consider like five different models, the CAPEM FAMA French three factor model, the Cahart model, which is the FAMA French three plus momentum, FAMA French five and FAMA French five plus momentum. And you could have gone on and on with like adding different uh, models, but I think those represent fairly well the well-established uh, 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 factor models in the literature. What we have in the first column, this original MV, this is the sharp ratio, the maximum uh, unconditional sharp ratio uh, full sample. You see that it's go, it go up as you go along these models because the models become more and more sophisticated. In the second column, we have the sharp ratio of the mean variance efficient portfolio hedged against recession. So see that in some of them is going to drop a lot. So for example, the CAPM goes from 48 to 39, and that's going to be associated with an upper bound of 59% of the variance. So there is a, uh, uh, that's the first comment I have below the table, which is recession risk explains at most 59% in this like most basic uh, uh, factor, uh, factor model. As you go to more sophisticated models, for example, uh, the FAMA French five plus momentum. So this is like a six, uh, factor model, the maximum sharp ratio is 120, but once you hedge against recession, it drops just to 1.13, which means that the overall sharp ratio uh, of this mean variance efficient portfolio is not very affected once you hedge against recession. So to some extent, the, the hedge against recession is not affecting your ability to reach a high sharp ratio uh, in the sample. And that's going to be associated with a cap of uh, a maximum like 14%. Uh, in the uh, in the variance of the stochastic discount factor. So as you go to more sophisticated frameworks, that bound is significantly uh, lower as well. Um, okay, so I think I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do is very quickly mention the results for the traded factors. And what we do for the traded factors is to conduct pretty much the same analysis except that instead of looking at uh, exposure to industrial production, to these broad macroeconomic indicators, we're going to look at the exposure to the market portfolio. If we look at the market, for example, it's gonna be very similar to betting against beta. But then we're gonna look at the exposure to momentum, to profitability, to investment, and so on. So we have like more, uh, we're not gonna be restrictly like only focused on the market portfolio, but we're gonna, try to hedge against, for example, momentum beta portfolios. And what we're going to find is that actually um, uh, our hedges are also going to uh, work. So this phenomenon that was documented in the betting against beta paper of a flat, knee, flat security market line seems to be a very pervasive uh, pattern that we see in the data. We see both on the macro side in terms of exposure to these uh, real uh, like macro uh, indicators, but also on the traded side, as we have not only with respect to the market, but to pretty much like most of the uh, most of the models. Um, and in terms of the because they are tradable, the analysis becomes a little bit uh, nicer in some ways because we have daily data, so we have we can do this uh, at like a higher frequency, and we have tradable factors. And the fact that it's tradable there um, it's easier to quantify the ability of the hedge because we can look at the alpha after controlling for the original factor. So that's uh, interesting uh, in that sense. 
Um, okay, so this plot, um, what we do here is we have all these like beta sorted portfolios. So what is going on here? Imagine that we're looking at these over here, uh, these, the blue dots on the bottom right hand side uh, of the picture. They are all like uh, trending like downwards. This is the high beta portfolio. This is the low beta portfolio. Now, what I'm plotting on the x-axis and on the y-axis is, let's say that I take this beta sorted portfolios, the first quintile, the first decile, and then I regress on the factor itself. I'm regressing on the market. So this is the beta that I have from that regression, and that's the intercept that I have from that regression. What is important from this is that this declining pattern means that there is a spread in terms of these intercepts. So if I long the first one and I short the last one, I get a significant alpha spread and I have a significant beta spread from the x-axis. The fact that everything is like declining and some are going to be steeper uh, than others. This is for the market. Uh, this is for momentum. Uh, you have uh, profitability, you have investments, you have HML and you have SMB. These are all the six factors uh, we, are, uh, we are considering. Now we're going to... Yeah. Um, the, the, I was just uh, remembering uh, Robert no Novi Mark's paper, uh, the betting against betting against beta. Um, yes, uh, yeah. A lot of criticism, like a fact of small caps and so on. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's something we're well aware of it. So um, just to quickly summarize, in the betting against beta, they use this like rank uh, weighted portfolios and they multiply by the estimated beta after applying a shrinkage to these uh, estimated betas. We don't do any of that. And the moment you don't do any of that, your, uh, if you do the long short portfolio based on market betas, you still have a significant spread relative to the market. But once you control for, for example, the Fama French three or five factor model, that result becomes insignificant. And that's like what Novi Mark, I think was like uh, part of it was about. So we have we are, we 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 don't face that criticism here because we're already doing everything evaluated in, in quantiles. Uh, that's a that's a good point. And the importance of uh, small caps here, like if you do for larger caps, you still have the same pattern or? Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we we condition. We had a version in the past that we removed the bottom twenty percent based on New York Stock Exchange. The results are very similar. And I think it's because we're using quantiles based on New York Stock Exchange stocks. So that New York Stock Exchange stocks are already larger. So we don't have that, that issue. Uh, but that's definitely a concern. Because usually if you do it uh, using all stocks to define the breakpoints, the extreme portfolios are going to have very high and very low betas, but just because they're very small. And, uh, and also once we do this, we do evaluate it. So if it's a small cap, it's not going to affect the performance of the portfolio too much. Um, okay, so this is the alpha relative to, uh, we take this, um, in this case, the market beta sorted portfolios. We long low beta, short high beta. So this is very similar to the betting against beta, except the, the methodology is a little bit different. And once you take this long short, this quintile long short, we regress on the market itself and we look at the intercept. This is the intercept. This is the alpha relative to the market. If you do the same thing for SMB, this is the SMB hedge portfolio. That's the intercept relative to the SMB itself. This is the intercept relative to HML itself. This is relative to CMA, relative to uh, robust minus weak and relative to momentum. So how to interpret these results? The fact that we have a a positive alpha here, it means that if you long, for example, the case of momentum, if you long the momentum strategy, which is already like a long short portfolio. So you're like, you long momentum short, low momentum stocks. And then on top of that, you short our hedge portfolio. Then you're gonna have a significant uh, spread uh, in alpha as well. So you eliminate the exposure to momentum and still earn a positive, uh, a positive return. This is, after controlling for not only the original factor, but also betting against beta and the DMRS factors as controls, because the DMRS factors are also designed to hedge uh, those, uh, those factors. And as expected, once you control for betting as beta, our results in the first column, they go away. 
which kind of makes sense because it's very similar uh, to betting as beta. It's just the methodology uh, is a little bit different. There seems to have nothing really going on in, uh, on the SMB portfolio. And for the other ones, they survive even after controlling for betting as beta and the DMRS, uh, the DMRS factors. Um, two more plots, I promise, like 31, 32, is that instead of focusing on specific factors, we're going to look at um, kind of mean variance efficient portfolios of different models. The CAPM is going to be the same as the market, but then the three from a French, three plus momentum, five from a French, five from a French plus momentum. And then once we have these mean variance efficient portfolios, we're going to hedge against uh, them as well. And what we have is that even after taking, for example, the most sophisticated model, the mean variance efficient portfolio, it's still going to have an alpha relative to the model itself. And even an alpha after controlling for all these things uh, as well. This is a non-tradable portfolio in the sense that we're hedging the mean variance efficient portfolio against betas to the mean variance efficient portfolio. But we can look at an equally weighted average of these uh, factors, which we know is like very close to the mean variance efficient portfolio. And we have exactly the same uh, pattern uh, uh, holding as well. Okay, so I'm really uh, out of time. So um, I recommend you, these results are like well explained uh, in the paper as well. So I'm gonna quickly uh, conclude is portfolios based on these macro sensitive portfolios, which is the key result in the paper. We view them as natural uh, test assets. They're, we construct these with like strong spreading exposure. And a key result we find is that exposure and expected relation and expected returns, that relation is flat as Rui uh, anticipated my slide number 33. Uh, and that's true even in recessions. And that's true like in 2020, which was out of sample, 2018, and as you like go back uh, in time uh, as well. And this pattern holds not only for macro uh, risks, which is the key result in the paper, but also to reduce form uh, factors. And it has also important implications because we can build hedges against these macro risks. So, and they are good hedges against recession led uh, financial crashes. These lead to like new test assets to evaluate, uh, to evaluate model. So in some sense, we view this uh, as providing a tool to move forward uh, in this consumption based uh, uh, literature. And one interesting um, set of calculations we do is that we can actually use our head portfolio to quantify, to put a bound on how much economic fluctuations and recessions, how much they matter uh, to, the stochastic, to the volatility uh, of the stochastic discount factor. In terms of the traded assets, we, you translate this into uh, alphas uh, relative to the uh, original factors themselves. Okay. Oh, great. Um, so now, um, any questions? Uh, I guess we have a one that I saw being posted on the chat. Bernard, do you want to take a look at it? Uh, yes, let me take a look. So how do you think that this is the first run evidence on the characteristics of cross-sectional variations, stock returns from Ken Daniel Dittman? Oh, that's a good question. Um, this is... Um, I think the, the focus is very different to, to start with, which is that uh, we have all these, uh, we're really focusing on hedging against these recession risks. Uh, and there they do something that is, um, uh, different, which is to use the characteristic of, for example, the book to market value of stocks, size, uh, investments and so on in a way to optimally hedge, uh, uh, optimally like eliminate exposure to, to the characteristics uh, and really eliminate, sorry, eliminate exposure to the, uh, in terms of the beta yet keeping the characteristics. So they basically construct, if that's the paper I'm thinking about, they construct uh, uh, these, um, for example, the HML that is not, uh, that is, uh, uh, has a similar book to market ratios across that, that portfolio. Uh, yet it has the exposure to, uh, to the factor. Uh, I'm not like, I think it's something related to that. I hope it's uh, a good, not too bad description. 
Uh, but what we do is different in that we focus a lot more on this uh, recession hedge, which is not the focus of, uh, of their work uh, at all. Uh, what the, the set of results that our paper speaks to is the, is the very last one on this uh, recession hedge, on these, uh, sorry, on the uh, reduced form asset pricing factors. There it gets very similar. However, the methodology is also extremely different. We have something that is like much simpler, which is these beta sorted portfolios which for example, allow us to uh, apply the same methodology to momentum uh, or to any uh, set of uh, risk factors for that matter. Um, but that's a good question. That's something we've been uh, thinking a lot about. And I think the key difference is this focus on, on recessions and these uh, consumption-based uh, consumption based models. Perfect. Um, any other questions? If not, um, Bernard, thank you very much uh, for presenting this great paper. It's my fourth time actually watching it, and I always oh. learn it. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, it's just that we had this for a while, and then I, we updated oh, I, the COVID. So it, it's yeah, yeah, it's not very new. So uh, um, I think it's, it's much it has better a now, actually. Um, so maybe uh, since we had uh, only a few questions, can are you can you unmute yourself or like I don't no. know if you are running. I will. I will. One okay. sec. Um. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Sorry, I, I wrote it very quickly there. Um, so Bernard, thank you for the very interesting seminar. Uh, so if you if you regress the returns of your synthetic uh, this you know the recession hedged portfolio on all of your macro factors, will they all be kind of the beta of those factors will all be equal to zero statistically speaking or have you I mean this is what is implied right from from your results. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's going to depend on the magnitude of the hedge. If you, uh, so for example, the if you regress, I have one number that I know for sure, but the other numbers are very like similar. The results are very similar, which is that the if you regress the market portfolio on NBR recession dummies, for example, what you have is a coefficient that is like minus 30. So it, it drops about 30%. Uh, at annual terms is like annualized, so two and a half percent per month uh, when you have NBR recessions. When I just add the hedge portfolio, what happened is that number drops from, uh, well, it gets increased from like minus 30 all the way to, I think it's around like 15 or 12. I have that number in the paper, but basically reduces between like 60, 50 to 60 percent of the magnitude. So which means that if you um, add even more hedge, then you can eventually can fully eliminate that. We, we don't have to do that because we want to take the, a very simple approach, but it eliminates, I would say, like something like 60% of these betas. I have those, all these beta but, but just, in the paper. Just to clarify, if you, if you create a, you know, a hedge market portfolio, that's total hedge against macro factors. I mean, if you ignore that there are other risks, right, that you pointed out during your presentation, but then these, uh, the, the return, the expected return on this portfolio would be equal to the risk-free rate, right? I mean, I, I didn't, I, I didn't understand how you sort of ruled out the, the free lunch interpretation in your explanation. I, I, I was trying to understand. Uh, oh, I see. No, so I think this, yeah. I think this picture will help to answer that. Because on the left hand side, I have the market exposure. And on the right hand side, I have the hedge. So when you sum the two, you're essentially summing these two bars. So you see that the hedge, the coefficient of the recession is like 20, the other one's like 30. So you have about 10 something left. Mm -hmm. You see that okay. it doesn't fully eliminate. So when you have, for example, the dividend growth is about minus 10. And on the market is about plus 10. So that one gets very close to uh, very close to zero. Now, once you add that, all it means is that that market hedge portfolio is significantly less exposed to macroeconomic conditions, 
but it doesn't mean that the return will be uh, the risk-free rate. And you can see that here because this is the uh, the average return on the market plus hedge portfolio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so then it has a similar, it looks like a market portfolio in terms of uh, average returns and sharp ratios, but you don't have that exposure to, to the market. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that's, that's why I'm very you know, curious to, to understand theoretically how, how you could explain it uh, or whether that's related to your choice of you know, returns, frequency, or, or the hypothesis of linearity of your, you know, of yeah. your uh, betas, the way you, you, you estimate the betas. Yeah, we, we estimated it in different frequencies in like rolling windows. We didn't know anything much more sophisticated than that. Uh, to get like uh, maybe a little bit more forward-looking betas, but that would probably just make it uh, uh, more like robust betas. What is important is that there is post-formation betas. So to some extent, it doesn't matter much how we actually define these pre-formation betas because we have strong post-formation betas for different uh, factors. Now, in terms of the theory, all this is saying is that these recession uh, exposures, they don't seem to matter much for, uh, for the equity premium unconditionally. I think that's like, a, a, if you want to interpret it in this way, maybe there's something else explained. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's a very strong result, but that's why I'm very curious about, you know, the, the interpretation. But. Yeah, I think people have kind of two extreme views. Some people think it's very strong in the sense that, uh, we're finding a, a very simple and intuitive way to hedge against uh, macroeconomic risk. But at the same time, uh, there is this literature showing that there is a weak relation between macro and, and, and stock returns. What is puzzling, I think, is that uh, it, is, it holds even in recessions uh, and even in, it works as a hedge, especially in bad times when a lot of these uh, frameworks, they rely that the premium should be higher exactly in these periods. And we're able to avoid that, uh, that market crash uh, in, in a lot of ways for different uh, specifications. Yeah, but we are, we're also like uh, puzzled, uh, which is part of which I think we like the paper. But. The first chart is conditional on the recession somehow. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, the, um, I think well, this, yeah, this is just the regression, the coefficient. So yeah. this is the average return in recession. in recessions relative to non-recessions. Yeah, so it's like 30% and then in non-recession is like, uh, sorry, minus 30% in non-recession is like plus 10. And then the, the difference is about uh, 20, which is in the first slide. Any other question? I guess there was the last one. Thanks, Bernard, for the great presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, it was uh, very happy that I hope everyone learned something new. That's the most important thing. At least I had new graphs for you. <laughs> <laughs>